Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, good. I'll be doing good, even better when Thursday passes, God willing. Um, get our foundation big fundraiser done. Foundation, Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner is the 16th, always the Thursday before Thanksgiving, and... We're sold out, so I'm very grateful. We've been sold out. So I'm very grateful to that. People coming across the country, you guys are coming. Um, and, you know, all these celebrities that are coming and uh, with the Tony Dancers and the Tracy Morgans and the Larry Holmes and uh, I mean, just one after another. There's so many of them. I mean, Stephen A. and Max Kellerman and... Uh, just all the ESPN great people that are working there have been working there with me, um, Sal Palantonio, just one after another. And every year for 27 years, they've come. Just good people. I mean, that's what makes them a celebrity is that they use that power to make other people's lives better. That'll make anyone a celebrity, for me at least, and um, and, and a special person where we can continue to help people that need help, you know, whether it's with a food pantry, flying a, you know, a child out of state, a sick child that their family doesn't have the insurance that covers their treatment in, in state. They have to fly out of state. We fly them out of state. You know, we even cover surgeries, small surgeries that sometimes a very specific doctor has to do it, this, you know, for a very specific surgery. And the doctor doesn't accept insurance. You know, that's a reality. So we can step in and then pay for that for the parents that can't get it done and have to get it done because their child needs that surgery. And also the social programs where we bring mental health programs into the very difficult situations at in at-risk schools, Title I schools. In New York, that means... <laughs> A family making less than thirty five thousand a year. So you have, you know, poverty. You have a lot of you don't have fathers, you have problems. And um that's what we deal with. That's where we go. And we've been doing it for twenty seven years and we're we'll go in there, we'll bring mental health programs with psychologists, psychiatrists, mentors, you know, uh anti bullying, uh all the things that, that are are needed to combat these problems in in these uh, areas in the schools and in in these areas where it's uh, where they need they need help in those ways and um, you know depression you know just a myriad of things that that the mental health uh, you know that that deals with mental health which is still unknown compared to a lot of the other physical ailments that, you know, our great doctors and scientists deal with. But the mental health is still one that, you know, doesn't get enough, uh, doesn't get enough, uh, enough help in those areas sometimes. And, and it's a very serious issue. I, I mean, if you just look at the news every night, you see how serious it is when you see the homeless people. Most of them are, uh, that can be attributed to mental health problems where they're, you know, out on the streets. And um, and then you see the violence where you see these mental, mentally ill homeless people pushing people onto subway tracks. And again, those 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 people need help. So anyway, we we can't do it without, you know, it takes a village, right? We can't do it without people. We're a collective effort. And for 27 years, we've been able to put together millions and millions of dollars to get directly to people that need it. That's the thing I feel maybe the best about, two parts of it. One is that we don't make you go through jumping through hoops to get help. We verify it, we get the help to you. We don't want you to lose more than you lost when you come to us already. We don't want you to lose your pride, your dignity. We don't want you to go through all that. Uh, we, we verify it, we, and we, we take care of it. And the other thing I feel you know proud of is we don't have those administrative costs that a lot of these great organizations have, you know, where you find out that 4% goes to the actual, um, you know, whether it's a 
whether it's a, for a cure or, you know, what, whatever it is, but 4 or 5% goes to it and the rest goes to administrative costs. We, we, we barely have. We have one paid employee and we have a small office. <laughs> That's it. And we've become pretty big. Uh, and yet we've been able to still work with volunteer base, you know, help other than a one paid employee. And she's um, tremendously underpaid, I must say. Um, but I give her a lot of love and I buy her lunch a lot. So uh, <laughs> that makes up for it, I guess. Well, it, Teddy, for the people listening, um, Rob is going to be giving away two sets of two tickets to a premier table at the dinner. Go to the uh, go to the fight with Teddy Atlas uh, Twitter and Instagram handles. Follow the accounts and look for details there today or tomorrow for how you can uh, win those two sets of two tickets. So four total tickets, two sets of two, and uh, Rob's going to be running that from the social channel. So go check that out if you if you're in the New York area and you'd like to come and say hello and attend the dinner. We'd love to see some of the fans there, and uh, those tickets will be made available. Yeah, that'd be great. We and. We're going to have, you know, besides the entertainment world and uh, Sid Rosenberg, the great radio guy, but besides the entertainment world and, uh, you know, the sports world, which we have well covered as, we're, again, we're blessed. We do every year that the celebrities know where the money goes and they, they support it. And I couldn't be more grateful for them. But we'll, we'll also have a good coverage with the boxing world. Paulie Malinaji and... Chris Algieri, Larry Holmes, Iran Barkley, the former middleweight champ who knocked out Tommy Hearns, actually beat Tommy Hearns twice, the great Tommy Hearns. Um, you know, and uh, and also Rashad, um, which uh, I don't want to mispronounce his last name, the, the great UFC Hall of Famer who also now does commentary. Uh, Rashad Evans? Yeah, Rashad Evans, yep. Um, he's a, not, not only is he a great you know, MMA champion and, and former champion and Hall of Famer, uh, he's a he's a great commentator and, and a great person. He's going to be there and uh, hopefully a few other people from the UFC MMA world will be there too. I know Adesanya's manager, who's really a good guy, uh, reached out. He, we were together in Saudi Arabia and he talked to my son about it. So he reached out to my son to see if he could get out Al Al Algine Sterling. Um st you know, Sterling the former Algermain. Yeah, Algermain Sterling, Algermain. the former champion. If he could get him there and a few others. So we're still waiting for confirmation on that. But either way it's gonna it'll be a good night. It'll be a night where hopefully you enjoy it, you have a great time and most important for me is You'll walk away knowing why you were there. So, that's uh, we know why we're here. We're here to bring all the dimensions of the fights, every dimension possible. Uh, we we had a the zone Eddie Hearn promotion with boxing, with an undefeated fighter, with a very close decision. Eddie Hearn wasn't thrilled about how his man looked. He was very honest about it, so was his trainer. But we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about the great UFC card, which I'll tell you, you, you remember that movie, Ken, Night of the Condor? Uh, <laughs> yep. This was, Night of the, this was Night of the KO. I mean, wow. I, I can't remember the last time the main card, every single fight was a KO. I, I think, like, Tell me if I'm wrong. My math is off a little bit, but I think there was five main fights, and we're going to cover them all. But I think that I think four of them might have been the first round, and one was second round. Three in the first, okay. two in the second. All right, two in the second. Wow, that's I I don't mind it. I mean, I know the guys get knocked out too, but I don't mind it in a way that it makes the night a little earlier. <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it makes yeah. it makes like I because I'm up doing work and you know writing it down and going over it and tweeting and all that. So an earlier night is is well received by the Atlas household. I'm I'm not keeping everyone awake, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was a good night of fighting. Uh, it really was, and also before I give hand it off to you to bring us to it. 
Um, I should remind people that, well, you guys, you and Ken are gracious enough to come in for the dinner. You're going to stay over. We're going to do fight plans uh, at the in the gym where we always do with the great Martin Snow, uh, Trinity Boxing Club in Manhattan. We're going to do it there. So we'll have them, you know, for those fights. Uh, the ones we're doing it are Andrade and Benavides and also the other one that we'll be doing it on uh, will be, um, what is it? Pro Gray Haney. and Haney. Yeah, Pro Gray and Haney. So two fights that obviously are important fights and fights that I think you, that's what we do it for, you, the audience, will be uh, looking to, to see and looking to, to see what the breakdowns are. Our, our record has been good with those. If you go to my bookie, you've done pretty good this uh, this this quarter, we'll say, right? You've done pretty good. You've Definitely. got some extra money for Christmas if you've been uh, if you've been listening to us and <laughs> and going to my bookie with you know with if you have a little extra to to play with. If not, you shouldn't go there. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, let's jump into it. Like you said, the zone card, Shabazz Masood edges Jose San Martin in a close split decision win. I'm sure that uh, to Eddie Hearn's point at coming in at 11-0 and with four knockouts, they probably thought Shabazz was going to walk right through a 34-6-1 and, 34, six and one, um, Jose San Martin, but he got a very, very close split decision uh, win in the 10-round 10, 10 fight. What'd you think? How'd you like it? And did the refs get it right? And did the judges get it right? One didn't get it right. He he should have his license immediately taken away, and he would. Luigi Luigi Boscarelli, 98-92 for Shabazz. He clearly wants to work for Eddie again. He shouldn't work for anybody again unless maybe as a short order cook somewhere. Um, I guess maybe. I don't know if he could make eggs, but... Uh, he can't make scorecards. Uh, n- not my world, and not in anybody's world. I don't think that's honest about it. <laughs> if if I, you know, if I get the national commission, I'm pushing for. He will get a pink slip on uh, on Monday. <laughs> he will. He, yeah, he will. There'll be a lot of pink slips. He'll get a note in his mailbox that just says, "See me after class." Yeah, he, there'll be a lot of those notes. Um, quite frankly, <laughs> that'll be going out. We'll be killing a lot of trees uh, to, to get all those notes out. But to answer your question, and for the question that people want to hear, uh, Mas- Masood, first of all, he's got a difficult style, and it's hard to look good with him and, and, and not, you know, his style's not conducive, really, to making exciting fights. You know, you know he... Um, I think he's similar, not as developed at all, but as similar in some ways to a Shakur Stevenson who controls range and very defensive-minded, very streamlined with what he does, doesn't waste anything at all. Uh, you know, very, 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 very cerebral, uh, but very contained. Uh, very, very contained, very controlled. He controls distance. Uh, he counters you coming in. You know, you come in six inches. You've heard me say it again before. He goes back nine inches. He looks to catch you. Uh, he likes, to, you know, it's all about keeping space, you know. And, and while he's keeping space where he can work and keep you from working or catch you before you get to him, he does go to the body pretty good. I, I was I was surprised with that. And he does that. It, it's It's hard to get close to him without being caught, you know, on the way in. And really to beat him, you have to you have to step with him, Ken. Uh, you know, as I talk about before many times where, you know, he's predictable in his approach. And he'll go straight back. You got to time him. You got to maybe faint him to go too soon and then go with him. But you got to go with him. And you can catch him on a straight line uh, going straight back sometimes. And then when you do get in, you got to work your you know, you got to work. You know, you got you to gotta make your hay while the sun is shine, shining. And you get in there, you got to keep your hands free. Uh, you got to pound the body, then go up to the head. 
Uh, you you got to be busy when you're inside. You can't get tied up inside. You can't smother yourself inside. You work like heck to get there. You got to do something when you get there. And and listen, uh, his his opponent, his opponent, uh, Sam Martin, he he did that. He did that uh, a lot. But early on, although Sam Martin was aggressive. The whole night, he wasn't effectively aggressive until later in the fight. Then, because that's how it works. Part of what you depend on, part of your style, part of your qualities, is to bring pressure. You know, if if that's one of the assets that you bring, is just to apply pressure for the most part. It takes time for that to work. You know, it's like boiling a pot of water. It takes time for the water to evaporate. It doesn't happen in 10 seconds. And it's the same thing with applying pressure (laughs) if you're a fighter. It takes rounds. It takes rounds to soften the guy up, to wear the guy down, to, to break the guy down, start to be effective, to see some of the work pay off and get and to pay dividends. I always say, you know, going to the body, applying pressure is like putting your money into CDs in a bank where you're going to you're going to get interest with time. Yeah, you and it's the same thing. You're going to get interest with rounds. You keep applying pressure, you usually see the payoff later in the fight. And you saw some of that with Sam Martin later in the fight where you started, but early on not as much. And um so I I had it where Masood was Obviously, using his jab, he he uses that uppercut well. Um, he you know he starts off moving laterally on the outside uh, to keep you off balance. Then then he controls straight away on you. The way I said, in and out. Uh, the uppercut is a big. I think it's a big weapon for him with the style, and it's a big weapon for him against the shorter man that he had in front of him the other night, where the shorter man is always coming in. Uh, in a predictable manner, this front door, the uppercut can catch the shorter man. So he looked for that, and the, he's got a predictability, uh, Mossad. You know, he for the most part, that's what he is. You know, he's he's out in front of you, you know, tries to control you with the jab, controls range, steps out, looks to counter. Um, he'll sit inside in a in a box with you once in a while in in the. Uh, you know, in the kitchen with you every once in a while. He'll, he'll do that, and he did it later in the fight, which I think he needed to in the last round. Uh, and and he did he did well with it. So he showed that dimension and that that heart um, and belief and mental toughness to do that in spots. But for the most part, he's a guy who's you know he's going to be careful. He's going to he's going to be the surgeon. He wants to be a surgeon. He wants to surgically take you apart as you try to come in and um, try to make sure that. You know the scalpel doesn't cut him by accident. So, I, I, I also why I say he's one dimensional with that, and he might have to add dimensions. I his opponent was one dimensional with the pressure, always coming, always coming, always coming. Uh, so his trainer, massage trainer, you know Ben Davidson, he's a phenomena. I, I tell you, it's really amazing when I see him because. He's everywhere now, just like Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn is front and center. Every time you put one of their shows on, he is, <laughs> he is, my goodness, he is there. You know, I, sometimes I think he's gonna, he he's gonna be the ring announcer too. I mean, he is front and center. You can't miss him. And look, he does all the work over there. He's the big guy over there. Him and Warren, but really, him does most of it. Uh, and although Warren's got the big boy, he's got the, he's got the guy you want. He's got Fury, but. Hearn's got some pretty big boys too, uh, you know, like Joshua and the rest of them. And Ben Davidson, every time you watch a fight across the pond, it seems like you see him in the corner now. It's it's really amazing. This guy came out of nowhere. He he first showed up on the scene, as far as I know. His first fighter was Tyson Fury, uh, out of nowhere, and and now he's everywhere. I mean, it's a, and he was more of a life coach friend that really did help Tyson Fury. But now he's, you know, he he's a legitimate, I mean, trainer who's in the corners with top fighters all the time. So 
he um he was there the you know the fight was you know it's not Ali Frazier but the styles were Ali Frazier you know obviously uh Masood being Ali and uh Sam Martin as I said the pressure paid off a little bit he was much busy in the ninth round uh he was being much more effective late in the ninth uh you know because like I said earlier some rounds he was just being aggressive <laughs> but not really effectively aggressive. Down the stretch, he, he got some of that done more, uh, where he was more effective. Uh, and I think uh, it was a real good 10th round. Uh, Mossad stayed inside uh, more, as I said earlier. And uh, matter of fact, he stayed in for the most part the whole round. And he did some very good work. So he did show me that dimension and that, as I said, that mentality where he's willing to go in the pocket and stay there with you, uh, where he was, you know, countering and picking spots, landing nice short shots. Uh, it was it was definitely the quantity of Sam Martin for the most part versus the quality shots of Masood. Uh, the only complaint, I, I have no problem Masood getting a close fight. It was close. I have no problem because he probably... It probably landed the cleaner shots, um, and and like I said, he controlled range for a lot of the fight and was placing shots pretty well, but definitely was outworked, and that's why a lot of people thought maybe that uh, Sam Martin actually won. But I I, I give it to Musad. Just the, it was a criminal score, the ninety eight ninety two. The other two scores ninety six ninety four. Um, that's 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 fine. Uh, I don't give fights just for throwing punches and being aggressive. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking to see who's landing. But it was, as I said, it was a very close fight. Uh, credit to you know, credit to Eddie Hearn. I think he needed to be honest because he depends on the fans to believe him when he puts a fight on. So he's got to be honest, and he was honest. Him and uh, and Ben Davidson, they said that. You know, it was a close fight. They weren't happy or thrilled with the performance of their man. Uh, matter of fact, Eddie Hearn went as far to say, hey, he's going to have to be a lot better if he's going to want to be a player with the big boys, you know, in this business. He's going to have to be a lot better. I think part of that for Eddie, he's a promoter, right? So I think part of that is attached, Ken, to really what he's saying is, yeah, you got to be more exciting. You got to be better. You got to be busier. You can't be just fighting with this style and making close fights. You got to be busier. You got to go out there. You got to sell out a little more um, because otherwise you're not going to make money and I'm not going to be able to make money with you. <laughs> I think that it's attached to that, that if you if you don't get a more excitement to your style or, or at least a little bit <laughs> more, you know, uh, you know, if you don't put some a little bit of high test in your gas tank uh, to start doing a little bit more than just being that surgical guy, that guy who doesn't waste anything. If you don't start doing more, it's going to be hard for me to promote you and make money because you also have to be yep. entertaining. So I think that was attached to it. I'm, I'm, I would I would stand on a book of Bibles that I was right about that. Um, but Hearn did say, you know, you got to be better. Uh, and, and the last thing I say is, it's always the same M.O. with these fighters. Um, you know, who are the favorites? You know, with the promoter, of course, Mossad is with her, and he's the A-side. And when they get a decision in a close fight, one ref, one judge always goes big for the house fighter to make sure that they didn't screw up, that if things tighten up, they're good, they're way out ahead of it, way out ahead of it. So that's... You know that's the that's the security, and then the other two, you know, score it close, and it's like they take turns. Okay, you take the house fight at this time. I'll take the I'll take the B side <laughs> this time, and um, it's like clockwork. It really is. So that that's a problem. A national commission would be the only place that that could get really truly solved. But at the end of the day, I don't know. It was a 
interesting enough fight for me to watch an 11 and 0 fighter going through what he had to go through to you know at, at this stage in his career uh fighting a tough fight a fight that you know could have gotten away from him testing him a little bit i i have no doubt that at the end of the day Mossad will benefit uh will benefit from from that experience and uh and we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But um, the UFC, you didn't have to worry about uh, boring or, or not scintillating fights. You didn't have to worry. You never have to worry about that. But you definitely didn't have to worry about it because you got fans like knockouts, right? Uh, you go to a baseball game, you want to see home runs. You go to a fight, you want to see knockouts. Well, you if that's your taste you were very 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 well rewarded and satisfied saturday night uh from madison square garden where the ufc gave you all those knockouts one after another that that's for sure starting with the uh pop that donald trump got walking in with kid rock and, yeah that uh, was Tucker incredible Carlson. that was oof, crazy wow. wow what a you wow, know, if wow. there were 20,000 people there, 19,999 were cheering, and Bill Burr's wife was giving Trump the double middle finger. <laughs> Did yeah. you see that clip? No, I didn't see it. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, aren't you, you know, I'm just going to say this. Can't you show a little better class than that? I understand that politics is a dividing, divisive business. Uh, you know, I get it. I understand all that. But... Can't you show a little bit better class than that, no matter what side of the aisle that you that you like to walk on and you like to support? Can't you show a little bit better than that? I mean, I would ask the guy, look, if it was your guy up there and he was getting the applause, right, uh, and and somebody else gave the double mi middle, what, what would you say? And I guarantee you it wouldn't be good. I guarantee it wouldn't be good. And so sometimes you got to look at yourself. You got to hold yourself to the same standard that you hold other people in those situations. But look, uh, the only thing i uh, add to that, to have a little humor, would be the great comedian Sebastian Maniscalco, uh, where he would say, when he, if he saw that, he would just say, aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you embarrassed? <laughs> Aren't you embarrassed? I, I know the, the reason I'm thinking about Sebastian is because I know he was down in Atlantic City that weekend uh, doing a show because my uh, former fighter and, and ter tremendous friend, just because he's just a, he's a tremendous friend and person, one of my former fighters, uh, Jimmy McMahon, uh, he... Uh, who I actually retired undefeated because we had a little little concern about a medical issue we weren't sure about, and life is too important to to have any uncertainty, and he's healthy as heck, and, and he's successful, and he's a great father and great success in the business world and the working world, um, and I couldn't be proud of him as a human being, but we couldn't take a chance. He was like 14 and 0, I think, when I retired him, and he stuck with it. You know, I told him, this is it, all right? You know, I know you could go somewhere else and you could fight, you know, and um, but I, I'd like you to give me your word that, you know, I'm, I'm not letting you fight because we, we can't take a risk. I mean, it, you know, it might turn out to be all right, but it might not. And if it might not, we, we can't even contemplate uh, going there. You know, it's you know, we can't even think about it. And, and he's got a beautiful family. Uh, he's got a, a kid, uh, James. Uh, who's uh, who's a good little boxer, and uh, he's she's got he has a twin, beautiful sister, and then another brother, uh, and his uh, great wife. Just just a great family, and uh, I'm just happy that he's doing real well because, you know, his dream was cut short a little bit by you know by 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 fate and um, you know by my decision not to let him fight anymore too. So. Um, I'm I'm just glad that he's doing good, and I hope they had a good weekend down there with Sebastian. I'm sure they did, but I that's how I was thinking about Sebastian. I know that I know he was performing because they were going there. Well, um, before we jump into the action over at the UFC, let me give a quick shout out to our friends over at Athletic Greens. 
one of our favorite products. I know, Teddy, I know you take it every day. I take Athletic Greens every single day. To me, it's the one supplement I don't I don't dare start the day without. Athletic Greens is an all-in-one green drink. You take a scoop in the morning, and it's got all your vitamins, minerals, and uh, everything you need for a healthy immunity system. Made from whole food sourced ingredients, which is the key. No synthetics. It's all made from real food products. Uh, athleticgreens.com slash atlas. They'll t- send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. And those uh, travel packs are invaluable. I'll be taking them with me to uh, the dinner in New York, needless to say. Uh, let's jump into the UFC over at Madison Square Garden, Teddy. We'll start with uh, first fight on the main card. We had Diego Lopes uh, just blasting Pat Sabatini right out of the ring. 90 seconds into the first round. Knocked him out with a barrage of punches. Um, yeah. <laughs> not much to see here. No, just there's, there is something to see, though. I'll tell you why. It's, it's not the punch, at least from my perspective. As a trainer and, and an analyst... <laughs> I don't just look at the punch. We that that's self-explanatory. If it hits right and the guy can punch, it does the damage it does, and sometimes it knocks the guy out <laughs> or disables him enough to be finished. For me, I'm looking at how it landed, why it landed. See, I'm always looking at the science, um, even though it might look barbaric. There's always science, so I'm looking at why did it land, and I always I'm of the belief, being in business of this business fifty years now. <laughs> That most knockouts happen. Uh, it, it's never. It's not an accident. It's not luck, and most of them happen for just a couple reasons. Like within a a group of reasons, a very small group, like two or three. Either you pulled straight back, you got your head too high, you pulled straight, you didn't move after your last punch, you stood there, you took a picture. One of those reasons, and. I also look at the delivery system of how that punch got there. So I'm going to give a quick kudos to them, but I'm going to give a quick, real quick breakdown. Again, at first glance, nothing to talk about. First first round knockouts um, in the first two fights, and nothing to say, right? Uh, The guy got hit, the guy got knocked out. But I'm going to say that both of these knockouts in the first two fights, that they get caught and they come for the same reason. They get caught stepping out. The first one, Lopes versus Sanatini. San, uh, yeah, Sanatini. Sabatini. Uh, is it Sabatini or San? I thought it was San. I'm going to say one second. I'm going to say it was uh, Sabatini, but give me a second. Let me... Uh, yeah, no, Sabatini. S-A-B-A-T-I-N-I. Sabatini. Yeah, all right. So Sabatini Lopes. First one, Lopes, he gets the takedown, or actually a throwdown, as he throws Sabatini to the, to the floor. But Sabatini, he's, he's behaving like a fighter, gets right up. But he probably, if he had more time to think about it, he'd probably rethink that because he he gets right up and that's his downfall, really, because as he gets up and he moves out, he's vulnerable. You know, he's not set yet and he's exposed and Lopes knows it and he follows him and catches him with, I think it was a right hand on his temple. And he drops him and then jumps on him and grounds and pounds him. So that's that's the part I want to bring out. That, yeah, the punch knocked him out. But the setup, he gets thrown to the floor on a, a takedown move or attempt. And then he gets up a little reckless. And, and kind of, you know, kind of forgets. I mean, it would be kind of like being just like, you got thrown out of a bar. Uh, I know I use crazy analogies, but for me, they work. You get thrown out of a bar, you get thrown out of a place, and you're a little disoriented. As soon as you get up from the sidewalk, you you just run out to the street and you get hit by a car. 
that that's huh, that's a little brutal. That's a little rough. That's a rough uh, analogy. But that's kind of what happened. He, you know, he gets thrown to the floor. He gets right up, starts to move away. Bang. He gets hit by, not a car, but he gets hit by a, by a punch that, that puts him where it puts him. Then in the second fight, Benoit St. Dennis catches... Ben... Benoit St. Denis catches uh, Matt the steamroller Fravola. And one quick thing before you start, Teddy. I thought of you because as Fravola was going straight back in a line, I was like, think every time I see someone do that, I always think of you telling them, yeah, well, there's a train like, coming. Yeah. Don't try to get off the tracks by running well, down the, the tracks. Just step to the yeah. side. Well, that's why I preluded this, this whole conversation by saying – there's only a couple things that really get guys knocked out. If you really go over it the way I do, it's always for one of, of two or three reasons. And one of the main ones is pulling straight back, as I said, you know, two minutes ago. So he's he 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 goes straight back. Now in boxing, you go straight back. You, I don't let guys go straight back from the wrong distance because you get caught with a punch, a hook, a right hand, whatever. But it's even worse in in MMA because you could get caught with either a punch or a kick, you know. Um, you know, so if it's a no no in boxing, pulling straight back, it has to be a no no pulling straight back in UFC, uh, and that's exactly what happened. He pulls straight back, and he doesn't get caught a left hook or right hand. Uh, he gets caught a kick, and and he pays the ultimate price. So, uh, and then the the other one that I wanted to touch on was Andre and Dern, uh, because in the first round, Andre again, it, it, it's there's not a lot of it's not a it's not coincidence, it's not uh, really it's not just you landing a punch when certain people land more than others. It's because their technique is better. They're, they're more aware of where the openings are and and better trained to take advantage in those areas. And that was the case with Andrade and Dern. Andrade drops Dern twice. Uh, first with a counter shot in the first round, and just before the bell of the first round, she, she, um, she caught Dern in the, the, uh, on the inside, she, oh, she punched inside of Dern's wide shots at the end of the first round, so she punches inside at the end of the first round, and she drops her. Then the second round, Andrade drops Dern three times. First one, and it's always because of better technique and know-how. The first time, she drops her with a counter. The second one, she drops her punching inside of Dern's wide shots like she did in the first round. And the third time, she catches her again, going straight back going straight back. So she made a pay for technical flaws in all three. So it's not just that she's stronger and she's better puncher. She's got the better delivery, the better the just the better technique. And she uses it to be effective. And she was. Uh she's so Andre is so strong. Obviously a very good striker. And Dern made a huge strategic mistake, Ken, striking with the much better striker when Dern's strength is in jiu-jitsu, you know, on the mat. That's right. Like your son, you know, that's that's where she's strong. Uh, and, uh, I mean, that's, to use another analogy, that's like taking a knife to a gunfight. I mean, you're, you're, you're the much better jiu-jitsu person, grappler, Everything down on the on the mat. Why are you gonna Why are you gonna risk striking 
you know, again, you got to know your strengths. You got to know your weaknesses. You got to play to them. You got to get the geography that makes sense for you to play to those strengths or to avoid those weaknesses. I'll use another movie analogy. Uh, Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood. He would, he would say, a man must know his limitations. A man must know his limitations. Well, same thing. You have to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Can't let ego get involved. You know, how many times can you see these people say, oh, I'm going to beat her at, at, at her back. I'm, I'm going to show I can beat, <laughs> I'm going to show I'm going to beat her or him at, at their game. Well, not such a good idea when it's over. You know what it reminds me of sometimes, you know, when you talk about nerves actually you know when people go in there and just say like f it i'm just gonna go in there and start winging punches it's actually nervousness of trying to get the inevitable over with that's the sense that i got from dern is that she might have been overcome by the moment which would be surprising for someone who's so good but that's what like it a looked kamikaze like. Like, I'm going. you're talking kamikaze stuff yeah that's right yeah right Re reckless abandon and you can almost predict when you go in why would you go 50 50 exchanging punches with someone who's the better stand-up fighter ego. that's what always surprises ego. We're me touching yes ego. and f ego and fear yeah uh, yes. like i want this over with yeah and i'm f and i'm nervous so i'm just gonna go for it that and it's be like a toxic combination why? those two things yes yes it it always makes me it always that always comes to the forefront of what I'm watching when I see two guys, and let's say one guy's a better hooker, and the other guy's like, F you, I'm going to just throw hooks, and the guy gets knocked out, and you're like, you know he can hook better than you. Why are you doing that? But it's exactly what you would describe. It's like that kamikaze approach of like, I'm so nervous, let's just get this over with. Let's just do this, and I'll either, get, I'll either catch or get caught. And inevitably, if the other guy is technically better at you than that in stand-up or hooking or whatever the case is, you're probably going to lose that 50-50 if that's how you're approaching it. You know, it's always surprising to me when someone would play to the other guy's strength. But you nailed it perfectly when you said it. it's the kamikaze approach. The nerves are taken over, and you're like, I just want this over with. Yeah. Don't be a kamikaze pilot out there, by the way, people. <laughs> that's the, uh, that's, that's one of, I think that's one of the lessons f from Ken and Teddy today. Um, kamikaze, <laughs> no. No good. No good. No, no kamikaze, Paula. Well, let's get into the, the heavyweight interim title. Tommy Aspinall gets the win over Sergei Pavlovich. Oh, by the way, by the way, going back to the my bookie and that you got a little extra Christmas money, always full disclosure, I gave you that one. I gave you that. I had Aspinall, but I did not have to write one in the next one. I had Prochaska. See, always honest here. I had Prochaska yep. beating Pereira, but so you you finish one on one. You finish one on one. Yep. So uh, Tom Aspinall brings it home to Manchester. Manchester now has two heavyweight champions, boxing in uh, Fury and the UFC heavyweight champion, all residing, all the titles residing in Manchester with the exception of the other four heavyweight belts, which are in the Ukraine. But um, good fight right away. I mean, Jesus, you could feel, you could cut the tension with a knife in there. These guys, there was no room for error with both guys being like stand-up bomb slingers. One of my tweets... One of my tweets, really, and I, you talk about being on the money, but I, before it started, I said, this is like watching a, a, a lit fuse, a, a fuse that's been lit, and it's leading to a box of TNT. You're just wondering, when's it going to blow up? <laughs> that's that's the only thing that you're wondering. You're not wondering anything else. You're just wondering at what point does the fuse get to the box and of TNT and does it blow up? It turned out to be a short fuse. It turned out to be a because sometimes the fuse could be ten minutes, you know, twenty minutes, whatever. Like in a James Bond movie, you see the guy light the fuse, he takes off, like two hours later he's having a martini and you know and the fuse is just about to go. But this was a short fuse. And and really, to me, that was the Apple Pro tweet at that time. Like, 
I and I'm surprised they didn't post it. I was like a little disappointed we didn't get it posted. <laughs> I, I, I was. You know what I love about I, you? I was. You've been the friggin' voice of boxing for 25 years, and you still get excited when yeah. the UFC yeah, puts I you on little, during the I, broadcast. I, Whereas I'm like, never mind the tweet. He should be on there talking about the damn fights. I was a little. Come on. I was a little. A little, I was surprised, but uh, it was. <laughs> I was like, "Hey, come on! That was a good one. I should have been up there. Maybe I didn't get it up fast enough. Maybe that was the problem." But uh, that's exactly what it well, was. Uh, one, one quick thing: Pavlovich landed early, and I thought he got Tom Aspinall's attention. He really clipped him a good shot. I forget the exact sequence, but I remember yeah, thinking, "Oh shit, Pavlovich is fast. That was a good shot." And Tom was rocked. But credit to Tom Aspinall. Well, the thing about Pavlicek, he's always set. He's only got that one yeah. dimension, but he's always set for that dimension with his feet. Always ready. He He's like the rifleman, you know, where the the bullet is always in the chamber. He He's ready. And um, I think that helped. In the end, I think, and you're right, he did, he did uh, get his attention. I think that helped Aspinall in the end because... It, it really put him in DEFCON 4 or 5, where he was at full alert now, and he knew whatever he did had to be really, really on the button, had to be concise, and he had to execute it. Bang! You know, when, when, when the moment would come, it kind of it reminded him that when the moment comes, I have to execute, I can't miss, I got to take advantage of the first opportunity I get because if I don't, I might not get another opportunity. I really think that that was kind of the message sent to him by the little nick of that right hand from, um, you know, from Pavlov. Pavlov. Pavlovich. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing that I would say is, and it's not a surprise in the with all the guys in the UFC, but when you see a guy, when you see two guys in there right at the start, they all, they both look tough. Then you see a guy get clipped and you're like, oh, he's, he realizes he's in there tough. And you can see him even trying to get away, trying to look for a way out, even if it's very subtle. But with these, some of these guys, you see them get clipped and they're like, okay, you got me there. And they're right back in the pocket and focused. And Aspinall was able to turn it around and come back. But man, it's just. There's no place to hide in the UFC. These guys are so friggin' tough. Even when you catch them and you think you might have them like questioning his desire to be in there, he's like, nope, coming right back at you with even even more focus. And uh, what an entertaining fight. Granted, it wasn't very long, but I loved every second of it. Like I said, you could cut the tension with a knife. Yeah, as far as the breakdown of the fight, it, it, it wasn't a lot to it, but... Again, there's always the detail. And the detail was Aspinall used basics. He moved laterally to keep Pav uh, Pavlovich... Pavlovich. Yeah, Pavlovich from getting set because he's dangerous. And then he used his jab, you know, to set up the right hand. And he stepped in. And there was something that happened here that maybe people missed. But he caught Pavlovich as he was throwing his own jab, which left the door open for the right hand. He was throwing his own jab, and the right hand of Aspinall came just at the right moment where the left hand wasn't there anymore. It was out extended because he started to throw his jab, Pavlovich, that is. And he, as I said, he left the door wide open for the right hand of Aspinall to come in and land. And um and it and it did. He came in, landed, and you know, he he took care of business. So um again, basics. Just just you know, just good, solid basics, timing. And and as I said before to your point, I think that he knew he knew the danger that he was in there with, uh, Aspinall. And he knew that when he got an opportunity, he had to, he had to, he had to act on it. There, there might not be a second chance, and he did. He acted on it, and he did a terrific job. He took the fight on 17 days' notice. Again, it, it shows you that if you believe in yourself, <laughs> even if it's not the best of circumstances, sometimes you got to take the chance. And you know what you're taking a chance on? You're taking a chance on yourself. 
you got to just take the chance. You prepared your whole life for this. It's not full time, but you're You've been prepared your whole life for it. This is what you do. You don't know if this opportunity is ever going to come again. And you know what? Sometimes you just got to step up and say, hey, I'm, I'm betting on myself. I'm betting. I'm not saying if it doesn't make any sense. But obviously, he was in good enough shape. And uh, he, he, you know, he had enough belief in himself that, hey, sometimes this is destiny. Knocking at the door. This is my destiny. Everyone has a different destiny. <laughs> Everyone has a different path. Everyone has a different journey. Mine is to do it on 17 days. Bang, I'm going to make it work. And he made it work. So, And the thing that I loved about him, really, Espinal, he's a great guy. The other guy's a great guy, too. They represent himself with nothing but class and honesty. Uh, I, I loved him for that. Uh, and, and I just love how honest, because this is something that's in my wheelhouse. I talk about it all the time, the mental side how honest Aspinall was about being scared. He said, I was scared to death. And I was scared to death, he said. But he used that fear. He didn't let it use him. He controlled it. He didn't let it control him. And it was a great teaching moment. And I talk about that all the time when I when I get asked to go to the football NFL teams, to college teams, uh, you know, uh, now they're my team, the UConn Huskies, national champs, baby. You know, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, there's no other team in national. There's no other team in college basketball, just the Huskies. The Huskies, they're, they're mine and my family's team. And I spoke to them again this year. We're going to take the title again this year because they got the best damn coach on the planet and Danny Hurley, who will be there Thursday night at the Dr. Atlas Foundation 27th dinner. Oh, he's coming? Yeah, he's coming. He's coming. And not oh, only, good, good, and, good. And not only can... Not only does he have the best athletes, he's got the best human beings. And to me, character wins. Yeah, talent. Talent gets you there. Don't get me wrong. Talent gets you there. But character gets you, character gets you across the finish line, and character keeps you there. And, and he's got character kids, and it's not an accident. That's what he recruits. So, and coaches. So anyway, um, I, when I talk, whether it's in the NFL, whether it's there, whether, whether, wherever it is where I get asked to go and speak, I, I, I talk about fear is so on, it's, it's such a taboo thing that people don't talk about, but they all feel it. So what they do is they push it away, they try to ignore it, and then when you try to ignore it, it's still there, and it, it, it can do damage to you, and it does do damage to you. So you can't ignore it. You, you have to understand it. You understand that it's there. Nature put it, God put it there for a reason, to have you prepared. But you have to control it. But but it's there for a reason. And you got to stop thinking of fear. And that's the great thing about Aspinall. He taught that by talking about this. You got to stop, Ken, talking about or thinking about fear as an enemy. You know what I tell my people when I talk to them? It's your best friend. It's your best friend. And embrace it. Use it. Let it have you ready. Let it have your uh, adrenaline going. Let it have your sharp. Let it have you alert. All pistons striking at the right time. But what you don't want to let it do is take control of you. Take you to the wrong place. Control it. Use it. It was put there for a reason. The only reason, darn it, we all get across the street every day is we look both ways to make sure a car ain't coming and you don't get killed. Why do you do that? Because you're afraid. Nobody puts it that way. Oh, Teddy, that's... Sh no, no, no. That's fear. You're, you're afraid of getting killed and it's a good thing to be afraid of. So you look both ways and then you know that you're okay. Same thing in other aspects of life, in other places of life. Understand it's there for a reason. Control it. Use it. Let it be your friend. Let it take you to the promised land. Let it make you as great as you can be. And that's what Aspinel did. And, and I loved it. He talked about it so freely. And he said what I always say. He said, anyone who says they're not afraid, they're crazy. And I add to it, I say they're either a liar. I think he might have said that, actually. But I always say, anyone who says they're not afraid in these kind of circumstances, when fear should be there, when, when there should be that kind of alertness and, could, you know, a, a readiness in that way, anyone who says they're not afraid, they're one of two things. They're either freaking something wrong with them and they should go to a doctor to find out or they're a liar. So I thought that was a great part of it. 
He's a great guy to to root for. You know, it's he Michael Brisbane. I was happy for him. He's his friend. He's a great commentator and former, you know, champion, Hall of Famer. He uh he was happy. You know, he was there with him and he was, you know, he was thrilled. So it was nice to see the two of them share that camaraderie and and share his victory as friends and as both champions, you know, Brisbane a former champion. That it was it was a nice it was it was a good it was good. It was a nice fight, and I tell you the it really uh, the bookies had that one pick pretty close, right? They had that one. They know what they're doing. They they had that almost even money, right? I I, I don't know who was the slight favorite, yeah. but it was it was damn close. Yeah, it was very close. You know the one thing I want to say before I finish very close. that fight going in reminded me of the movie The Cinderella Man which depicted a true story of James Braddock fighting Max Baer. At the time, Braddock was supposed to have no chance. Max Baer was just a killer puncher. And actually, he killed somebody in the ring or somebody died in the ring. But he was a big right-hand puncher. And 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 he was so dangerous that Braddock knew that he couldn't make a mistake. He could not make a mistake. Otherwise, he would have got caught that right hand. And... He he wound up. The only difference in making that analogy, Braddock won a decision to pull off the upset and to beat the great puncher, um, you know, uh, Max Bear, and and win the heavyweight title. And he was the Cinderella man because nobody expected it. And a, a few months before that, uh, he was actually on on uh, home relief, welfare, if you will, uh, because uh, with the government was. Uh, because he was, you know, the depression had hit, and uh, they 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 were in a bad place, and he was actually on home relief. And then when he won a title, he took what what a I mean what a man he was. He he went back to the to the government office where he got the home relief, and he returned every dime that they had given him. You talk, I mean, that's that's special. That's 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 a man of pride. And he went back and he gave. He said, "I'm, I'm I appreciate that you, you know, I was given this help when I needed it. I don't need it." And he gave it back. Um, anyway, they did the. I think Russell Crowe was the star, and they did this movie, The Cinderella Man, again depicting that fight. That fight came to mind because, in some ways, it was similar. That you know, Aspinall was Braddock, uh, you know, and. Uh, he, his opponent was, uh, you know, uh, Provaska. Uh, he was the, he was Max Bear. You know, he was the guy with the dangerous right hand that could put your lights out. So it was, it was to me, it was, uh, it was funny because when I tweeted that, that this reminds me of that fight. I was basically saying, if it's gonna follow suit, and if it's gonna you know, if it's really going to wind up being reminiscent of identifying with that fight, then that means that Aspinall has to win because he's Braddock. And sure enough, he won. So, and the, one other thing I want to say before we get to the main fight. I love Bruce Buffer. I don't know. There's something about that guy, his energy, that... And he comes off so authentic. I know it's, you know, he. some people say it's over the top. They can't stand it. <laughs> but I, he's gotten to the point now in this business where so many people <laughs> are trying to reinvent the wheel, as ring announcers can, that, I know. that Bruce and Michael Buffer and Jimmy Lennon, I'll put him in there too, they come off as really the only authentic and a really original voices in the in that industry out there nowadays. I I I, I mean there's some good ones. I you know the the but I, I tell you, it's like everyone else is is just forcing it. It's like they're trying to invent the wheel, reinvent the wheel. It's like they're trying to you know. They're copying, obviously, to a degree that that happens. Everybody copies the originals a little bit, but then you got to put your own touch on it. Okay, it's just like 
it's just coming across like it's too there's too forced like it's almost too much pressure on them to like be to outdo those guys you're not gonna outdo those guys that's what you gotta understand just be who you are but you're not gonna outdo them because they're the originals yeah you know n nobody's outdoing coca-cola and and hershey's chocolate i mean they're they're the originals so I, I, it just struck me. I had to say some, you know. I, I had to say some. People know that I'm going to say something if it's if it's in my core. But um, Bruce and Michael Buffer, Jimmy Lennon, uh, they're, they're the only authentic sounds out there anymore. Uh, and and they are the originals. You know, of Jimmy Lennon, of course, his father came before him. But um, there's just such a plethora. I guess of of ring announcers that everyone's feeling the pressure to, you know, to try to outdo somebody. Uh, I I don't know. It's just sometimes you know, and then uh, sometimes you just shake your head. Like you hear some of them, some of them, and you're like, oh, God, why don't you, why don't your wife tell you that you know it's it's a little, you know. It's a little, it's a little too much. It's like you, you're trying a little too hard right now. You know, just you know, find your spot, find your niche. You know, uh, but man, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's just I had to mention that. But but thank goodness for the originals. You know, and that doesn't mean yeah. that somebody that there's not someone else to carry the baton. I I, I I'm all for that. To, to hand it off to. There always is. But right now it's it's this this that track trying to get the baton that lane that's trying to get the baton, it's it's overcrowded. It's 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 you know, people are running in people are running themselves over. <laughs> They're running over each other trying to trying to get to that baton. But anyway, that's talking about batons. Let's get to the last fight, um, Prochaska and uh, Pereira, the main event. Alex Pereira knocks out Yuri Prochaska in the second round. Um, you know, fight was pretty much what you would have expected. Uh, Prochaska going for some takedowns here and there, and Pereira doing a great job of keeping him at distance. That leg kick is so vicious. I mean, he destroys people with that leg kick. Daniel Cormier was talking about he posted a video earlier in the week clowning around with uh, Perea, and Perea was just kicking him in the calf. But, I mean, really in slow motion. And even when he did it in slow motion, Daniel at the time was like, Jesus, that hurt. But he, you could tell he's like, he's really weaponized that low kick to the calf. He destroyed Izzy's legs in both fights, which is even more miraculous of Giz that Izzy was able to stop you know him why after he all does the it? You know why he, he does it besides the obvious? He wants to take your ability to strike away and ability to have power and to set... Because because the power comes from the floor it comes from the basement it comes from the foundation if you don't have a foundation up top's not going to be able to do anything so the power in a punch comes from the legs from downstairs and if your legs aren't there then you got no power so obviously it does it for that reason but there's a psychological reason too he's a great striker he's a kickboxing champion he's a great great striker he wants to he he wants to be the only he he don't want no he wants to kind of he's sending a message and there's only one striker in this ring and it's me and he's almost forcing you to go somewhere else like he's sending a message you know where hey the you know there's only one gun here you know like if you're going up against Billy the Kid you know there, there's only one fastest in the West there's not two and Everyone thinks they're going to be the fastest in the West until they meet the fastest in the West. Well, guess what? You just met the fastest in the West. There, 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 there's gun battles going one way. There, there is no gun battle. You know, there is no shootout. There's just me. I'm, I'm the only one going to be doing the shooting <laughs> over here. And, and really, I, I've feel that that he's sending he's so as part of him it's so that that is such a important part of him his psyche his identity 
that he's a great, great striker and that there's only room for one. So right away, he, he disables your freaking legs and he says, in case you had a night, thought that you were going to also be a striker tonight, get rid of it. Because, again, there's only one gun in the West. There's, there's only one Billy the Kid, and it's me. And, and there, there ain't going to be nothing else. And he sends that message. Again, it does the job physically, but I think it's a mental message too that, that he's sending out there. And I tweeted before the fight that uh, Prohaska is bigger, naturally bigger guy, but Pereira has the power to hurt him. And I said, you know, as I always, one of my cliches now, punches are born, they're not made. No matter what weight you're at. And that he would carry the power up in that weight. I also said that Pereira needs to stay on his feet and he needs to move and then catch Prozhaska coming in with a counter. And that's exactly what happened, obviously. Um, and I wouldn't be saying it this way unless I tweeted it before the results, not after the results. Uh, anybody could be a Monday morning quarterback, um, obviously, uh, after the Sunday afternoon football games but first round Prohaska as you said he has his legs damaged by Pereira um, you know designed to make it hard for him to set to punch right and um, take away his power and his ability to kick um, you know uh, and uh, I think also what he did besides taking his punching power away and discouraging him and sending that message, he knew that he, one of the weapons of Prohaska, uh, Prohaska is his awkwardness, his being where he, so, where he can come from unexpected angles. I think that's part of his, what makes him so difficult and dangerous, is that he is so unpredictable. And by taking his legs away, not only did he take his power away, but he took the ability for him to kick, to be awkward, you know, to do these unorthodox things. He took some of that away. In other words, he made him less unorthodox. He made him less awkward. He made him, he made him less dimensional. And he took some of those dimensions away. And I think that that was part of the plan too. And that's to my point that I always say the top guys are cerebral. They're not just the toughest. They're also the smartest. And I thought it was brilliant. I just thought it was brilliant that Pereira did that. And I'm giving him credit for it because I believe he did for all those reasons. That um, it would make it would make Prohaska more one-dimensional and eliminate, as I said, some of the awkward, unexpected things he does. Um, now, it took most of the first round, but... Prochaska finally got the geography he needed and took Pereira to the ground where he had the edge after absorbing a lot of kicks. Um, and Pereira, you know, by having him on the ground, Pereira couldn't strike, obviously. You know, he could not use his greatest weapon, which is his ability to strike to counterpunch. Then the second round, as, you know, I had, I had, said, and I had put out there as a prediction, that Pereira uh, would be looking for a counterpunch by keeping range, keeping distance, moving a little bit, and then just looking for a counter opportunity. And then, of course, he got it. He got Prochaska coming in careless. He, he landed great counter shots, two of them, the right hand first, and then a beautiful, beautiful short Joe Lewis-esque left hook. I mean, it was like a Joe Lewis left hook. Joe Lewis, to me, was the greatest heavyweight of all time. Muhammad Ali, right there, second. I know that'll bother a lot of people, but it doesn't bother me. That's what I believe. And Joe Lewis, I think, was the greatest finisher in heavyweight history. When he hurt you, goodbye, Sayonatra. Uh, you're, you're done. It's over. And he got rid of you. And part of the reason was he threw short punches. And this was a Joe Lewis type short left hook that was just not as beautiful as it was damaging. 
Um, and it, you know, obviously, uh, it, it, it finished him. And why does a short left hook finish somebody? First of all, you don't see it. It's compact. It's all power. It's a real snap in the shoulder. And um, it's, it's pinpointed. At first, it looked like a fast stoppage. But then you could see that he slumped forward, Ken, on the floor as Pereira was, you know, jumped on him and was, you know, going with the hammer fist. And when he slumped forward, I want to give the referee, I, I tear these refs apart when they do a bad job. I want to give him credit. At first, people thought that it was too quick. But on further review, it was, it was, it was anything but. And the referee prob- might have saved his life. I mean, the referee did a great job stopping it where he did. Otherwise, he would have got hurt. And Pujaska said it um, to his credit. Again, these warriors are so honest. These are honest. These are honest warriors. Whether they're doing the conquering or being conquered at that particular time, they they all have class and and just completely honest warriors. And he said it. He came right out. You know, a lot of people might say, "Oh no, I could have kept going." Whatever he said uh, afterwards, nah, I was gone. He said, I was gone. The referee saved me. Uh, I, I was done. I, I, I Basically, he didn't know where he was. So, um, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, like I said earlier, it wasn't the night of the condor. It was the night of the KO. And, uh, and that's exactly how it ended. It started with the KOs in the main part of the main event, uh, main card, and it finished with... Uh, it finished with KO. Yeah, incredible card, uh, action packed. Um, we could do with some big boxing matches, that's for sure. But um, that's really all we've got in terms of uh, fights. We've got a fight night next week. Let me just check the boxing calendar. I don't think there's any big boxing fights coming up until December 8th when our man Regis Progre is back in action against the great Devin Haney and we'll do a uh, fight plan for that one to get everyone up to speed and be prepared to what to look for in that fight I think we'll do that and we'll do the um, Andrade versus Benavidez fight plan Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about from this past weekend's action Teddy I don't think like I said I don't think there's any big boxing coming up Shakur Stevenson's in action against Edwin De Los Santos, I can't imagine that's going to be competitive. No, no let me um, tell you something, Ken. I'm gonna, go I'm ahead. gonna back you up on that one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, straighten you out on that one. That's gonna okay. be that one's gonna be potentially a lot more competitive than than you than you just said because um, Stevenson's opponent pronounce his name again, so I I don't want to butcher it. Um, those. Those, I hope I'm. I'm. Yeah. I hope I'm no, saying no, you, it right I'm myself. Sure it's um. Santos. Stevens. Edwin De Los Santos. What, what's the first part? De Los De Los Santos. Yeah, De Los Santos. I just when I can, I want to Edwin. say it right. But anyway, De Los Santos is uh, he? He can fight. For, he can punch. He's got fast hands, um, and. He might have some of the nuances that you need to fight such a difficult style and talented guy like Stevenson, where Stevenson will control range on you. You know, he won't make the most exciting fights, but he's very effective in pitching, you know, pitching a shutout, not letting men get on base, you know, taking the bat out of your hands. Where you go in six inches, he goes back nine. He looks to counter. He's good defensive. He's very cautious. You know, he doesn't take a lot of risk. He doesn't waste much. Um, you know, he's he's a you know he, he's a he's a difficult guy to look good against and a difficult guy to deal with. Uh, his style is a son of a gun, and um, and he's got you know he's got talent. Uh, he's got the amateur pedigree with the silver medal. He's he's got he's got it. He's got all that. But De Los Santos, I'm not saying he's going to win, but I I'm going to say he's going to represent himself well. I, I'm going to say that oh, you want the line. You want the line yeah, from our friends yeah. at my bookie. 
I'm sure my bookie will appreciate it. Shakur Stevenson, minus 1,500. De Los Santos, plus 650. Yeah. Over, under, over, my, over minus 375, under plus 230. So they definitely think it's going the distance. And yeah, Stevenson Shakur's don't stop, guys. Stevenson don't knock out, guys. But um, look, I, I like the over, uh, but I would take a look. Minus 375? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I'm, wood. Yeah, I'm not saying that's not where my play would be. I like the over, gotcha. but my play would be on the underdog. You know, nothing big, but with those odds, put a couple peanuts. You know, put a peanut or two, uh, as Bill Krakenberger would say, the the handicap of my friend from Las Vegas that does the handicapping in the sports world, uh, and and Alan Boston also, who's a tremendous college basketball not only handicapper he's actually uh he he's actually a legend a legend you look him up google his name alan boston but anyway and a, and a good man um if if you want to just have a little something on it to have a little play i would put a little something on de los santos because you're getting those kind of odds you get something back and if, and again he knows how to fight He's a he's a southpaw, um, which you know can help him a little bit. Uh, even though Stevenson don't have really problems with southpaws, he probably faced uh, a million of them in the in the amateurs with two hundred fifty amateur fights or whatever he has. So that shouldn't be a problem. But he is a southpaw. Uh, he's he's got long rangy arms. He's wiry, and with he does certain things I like in this matchup. Um, one of the things that I like that he does is he doubles and triples up his jab when looking to close the gap. That's a good thing against a guy like Stevenson who you're going to have to close the gap. If you throw one jab, you ain't closing it. You're just not. Yeah, You're not getting there. You're going to fall short and you're going to get counted. If you throw two or three, you got a shot to get there if you're stepping in quick enough. And he closes the gaps pretty fast. Pretty fast. And if he can use a double jab to close the gap at the right time when Stevenson steps out and he can step with him, he he might have a little he might have a little good fortune in spots. Um to get a little sum. He's gonna have to go to the body too. Um because with Stevenson, you know, you're better off going to the body for two reasons. One, uh the body's a little easier to hit than the than the head and two if you go to the body and you're effective enough to the body, you can take some of the legs away, which Stevenson depends on, obviously, to be successful, to, to you know, to, to avoid you, to get out, to, to create range, to create counter opportunities, to be defensively, you know, secure. So I, I, I like this, this Los Santos, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But most of those fights, I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk on the counter to watch Stevenson because just you know, if, if you're if you're a boxing aficionado, and I I guess I am, but uh, you you know, kind of like I always use to the the same analogy of you go to a baseball game, do you want to see home runs? Then you don't want to see. Uh, you don't want to see a pitcher who hits the corners. Greg Maddox, you know, Paulie Malinacci. We were on Pro Box the other day breaking it down. And Malinacci said, Teddy, you talk about Greg Maddox. Yeah, you remember Greg Maddox from the Cubs, uh, you know, and from the Atlanta Braves where he he didn't have a fastball over 80 miles an hour. But he he changed speeds. He, he hit the corners. You know, he took the bat out of your hands. He kept you off balance. And... If you like that, if you go to a ball game and you want to see that, well, then you like Stevenson because that's what Stevenson does. He's Greg Maddox in that way. And that's a great talent and a great ability to do that. Um, but if you like to see, you know, if you like to see uh, uh, a bonfire uh, when you watch a fight, then then you're not getting a bonfire. You, you know, you, you might get a couple sparks, maybe. Maybe, uh, but you're not getting anything close to a bonfire uh, when you watch him. So maybe De Los Santos can make it a a little closer to a bonfire uh, because, like I said, he's he, he knows what he's doing. He's got quick hands. He can punch. Uh, he's only got one loss. 
Uh, I think he's got the confidence to believe that he, you know, that he can do it. So we'll, we'll see. So I think it'll be a little bit more interesting than you that you had said and that most people would think. Uh, hopefully I just gave somebody a, a reason to take a peek at it. And hopefully it doesn't turn out the other way where <laughs> where, where Stevenson just whitewashes them, uh, you know, in a, in a completely uh, boring one-sided fight. Yeah. Well, Teddy, that's all we got for this week. Uh, you got anything else before we say goodbye? I know you're busy getting ready for the uh, for the dinner, and uh, like I said, we'll all be there on Thursday, and we'll have we'll have uh, two sets of two tickets uh, available. Follow our social media channels, and Rob will get some details up there as to how you can access those tickets. No, that's it for me. I think we covered this like uh, like a blanket or a quilt or something along those lines. So I think we covered everything that had to be covered. That's it. Well, thanks, everyone, for being with us. Like I said, follow the social channels if you're interested in those tickets to the uh, Dr. Atlas dinner. And uh, we'll be back next week, per usual, with a full breakdown of all the action. Please don't forget to subscribe to the U YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube. We appreciate you. Be good, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>